I'm going to get the next session underway. Stand up for a second or two if you want, but uh, we've got a stellar uh, lineup of experts on telehealth, on health literacy, and uh, e-health today. Um, I'd like you to read their bios in, in your handbook or on the internet as we go. Uh, there's too much to say about them to, uh, it's gonna take up too much time, but Branko Seller is uh, an engineer, uh, a biomedical engineer, electrical engineer, and he's a pioneer and a uh, outstanding researcher in uh, telehealth. I'm gonna call him Professor Gadget and he's gonna talk to us for, thir for uh, 25 minutes. Oh my God, back one and that's it. Well, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here and I want to thank Maria and the committee for inviting me. Um, I'll be talking to you about two areas that hopefully you'll find interesting. The first one really is telehealth and manage management of chronic disease. And that follows on from a passion that I've had since about 1996. Uh, I did my first trial in 2001 in Wagga Wagga and, and Eastern Sydney, and the results then were quite spectacular. 98% compliance, very high acceptance by patients, difficulties with nurses and doctors, but nonetheless a really successful project. It's taken us all these years, and we are still not at the point where we can actually roll out telehealth nationally. And the first part of the work that, that I'll be presenting is a national trial that we uh, developed at the CSRO, which was funded from the NBN Telehealth Program, designed to give governments the sort of information, the sort of comfort they need in order to be able to introduce a new mode of healthcare delivery. Of course, what drives all these aging populations, we all know that. Uh, in the next 30 years, those aged over 65 will double, those aged over 85 will quadruple. And that has a very big impact on things like mobility. And we know that the frequent flies, the 2080 rule applies, if not more than 2080, it's often 1090, that people that are aged are very high users of services, and as, as they age, the morbidity increases. But of course, the consequence of that is that uh, admissions to hospital increase quite dramatically as you age. And the consequence of that is that out of all the different services that we deliver in this country, the cost of primary care services have been tracking CPI, the cost of delivering services in hospital have been going at three times CPI, so that the cost of hospital admissions are now uh, have doubled over the last 10 years. And this is just a very quick figure to tell you that. So we need to deal with this, because we don't need to deal with this, the organisations responsible for funding hospitals, the states, will be bankrupt by about 2043. In other words, 100% of their budgets will be health. Now, when I started this work in 1998, this wasn't visible, so the precipice was a long way away. But now many people have their fingers over the edge, looking over the edge, and they're realising that if we continue delivering health the way that we are, we will have no education, no police, no nothing in the states, because the state budgets will be 100% health. And of course, we're also now more employing more people in health than any other industry in Australia. We outstripped retail in 2012, so that now we're the largest workforce in Australia, and is that really sustainable as well? So telehealth is possibly a way of resolving this. And of course, telehealth has lots of different names for lots of different things. Some of it is primarily video conferencing, that, that's what we know it as. But internationally, by far the strongest role of telehealth will be improving self-management of individuals at home to manage their own chronic conditions through telemonitoring. And that's what I'll be talking to you about primarily in this particular talk. Um, so typically what telehealth is, a bunch of patients that have been selected because they have complex chronic conditions, we try to keep them well at home and to avoid them being hospitalised. They can pick up a number of different... Um, they can pick up different technologies from sophisticated ones to quite simple ones. The data is collected by them at home once a day. It goes into a sort of centralised server that may or may not go up to that horrible word, the PCHR. But then fundamentally, we also define here a new role, the care coordinator. Not the caregiver, but the care coordinator that reviews this data, often uses advanced data analytics, smarts, to work out which patients are stable, 
which ones are showing early signs of disease or exacerbation of their condition, and which ones are showing acute signs of exacerbation, and then orchestrate the best possible response to avoid hospitalisation and to improve that patient's health at home. And of course, that involves communicating with family and carers, the GP, the community nurse, and the hospital. So the key coordinator role is quite a new definition, but it's a very, very important role, and we've defined that in the project that we've actually started. I'm going quite quickly, but you'll have these slides afterwards, so if I'm going too fast, don't worry, you can have them afterwards. So we went through a process, process of selecting a company. We ended up selecting an Australian company that uh, went broke twice because there's no market for telehealth. It was one of the early pioneers in this area. It came out of the University of New South Wales, and unfortunately, I was the pioneer that started up, so I went broke too. Uh, nonetheless, I withdrew from the selection process because CSRO is very concerned about probity, but they ended up selecting an Australian company to do the technology. And the company um, really has a number of uh, features that are unique, which I won't go into. But first and foremost, whatever it collects from the patient, all the original traces are kept critically important for quality control because many of our patients have got things like cardiac arrhythmias. So when you use an automated blood pressure monitor, that can often be very inaccurate. So to be, when you review the data and you have the traces in front of you, you can actually do quality control. I don't have time to go into all those sort of technical details, but the device that they have developed is here. This is a desktop unit. They also have mobile tablets with devices, but this has no batteries, so we don't have to worry about changing batteries. It's got, uh, as you can see, both a web camera for video conferencing, a blood pressure device, uh, pulmonary, it's a respiratory full-blown medical spirometer, ECG electrodes, pulse oximeter, and various other things, and body temperature. It's fully integrated. It wakes up at a certain time of the day. The patient takes the measurement, uh, and then they can forget about it quite quickly. So the measurements it takes is non-invasive blood pressure using oscillatory and cellometry, pulse oximetry, single lead ECG, blood glucometer, spirometry, body temperature, body weight. You can message your carer, and you can also do video conferencing on the device. And it has a large range of questionnaires for COPD, CHF, wellness, emotional well-being, care or stress, etc. So it's a fairly comprehensive suite of services into the home. And this is completely now routine and works really well. And our oldest patient is 92 years old. So whenever people say patients won't do it, that's what I was told by the doctors all the time in 2001, they were totally wrong. The patients can do it with well over 98% compliance. The problems that we've had has been primarily to do with workplace cultures and organisational change required to introduce a new model of care. That's been the challenge. Uh, the health economics of aged care is such that it's quite clear that if an acute hospital bed costs about $1,000, telehealth costs about $7 a day, and telecare, which is simple alarms, about $3 a day. And in the US now, there's over 75,000 people being monitored by the DVA at quite a low cost. Um, the evidence for the performance of telehealth is quite overwhelming nowadays. If anybody says the evidence isn't there, it's rubbish. The evidence is there and it's very clear cut. I'm going to fly through some data just to show you. This is the uh, whole system demonstrated from the UK. That shows 15% reductions in A&E, 20% reduction in emergency admissions, etc. This was a fairly poorly designed project in many respects and it was all blunderbust. There's actually much better results than that. Uh, U.S. Veterans Administration, as I said earlier on, has got over 75,000 people. They have over 85% um, levels of, of acceptance, 19% uh, reduction in hospital admission, etc. But if you go to other areas, for example, monitoring people with cardiac pacemakers, the impact of telehealth is quite dramatic. You reduce hospitalisation, you reduce incidence of adverse events quite dramatically, and the data is here. I'll let you read it in good time yourselves. And... Um, uh, then if you look at the right-hand column of some of this data, which was summarised very quickly, the impact of emergency, uh, attending emergency departments are reductions of 29%, 19%, 59%, 49%, 66% for COPD. So you can reduce hospital admissions by monitoring people for COPD at home be anywhere between 30 and 70%. That's quite dramatic. And you do that, and why is it such a large range? Because, of course, the baseline conditions vary, and it's very difficult to track that. But nonetheless, the evidence is between 20% and 70% reductions. And there's more, 64% versus control, 20%, 58%, 44%, 19%, uh, 52%, 45%. So, you know, I, I just wanted to show you that the data does exist. And a small trial that we did with hand-picked people that had very high uh, disease, we had 70% reductions in hospitalisation. So 
We have this evidence, but we can't get the government, or this country particularly, that was a leader in this area, to roll out telehealth. So the CSRO started doing a project, which was funded by the MBN Telehealth Program, to say, we're going to do something different here. We're going to look at six different uh, models of care that exist in Australia, from Townsville to Tasmania. We're going to see what happens when you introduce telehealth into those models of care. And we're reporting on this study on the 26th of September, so I'm two weeks away from reporting it. So I'm not going to give you that data because we're not allowed to release it quite yet. Um, it's a very sophisticated project. It's a before and after controlled intervention. So for every patient that's a test patient that's been monitored at home, we have two case match control patients that are matched identically that don't have telehealth at home. Um, and I can tell you now that the variation in how this was accepted was dramatically different depending on the people and the processes that existed in that particular location. So again, it wasn't an issue of technology, it wasn't an issue of, of patience, it was an issue of people and process. Where we had great motivated people that were able to step outside the box, we had fantastically good results. When we didn't have that, results were very difficult to implement even after 18 months. So these are some of our partners. Uh, uh, basically, primary care trusts, uh, government, hospital departments, uh, ARV home care, so a range of different ways of managing and monitoring uh, people that have chronic disease in the community. Uh, very sophisticated governance model, and another point that I may point out, that in order to carry out this project, we were told we needed to have one ethics committee clearance, well, we ended up doing eight. So what the NHMRC says about ethics committees, ignore it, because every local health district will want to have its own ethics committee reproduce everything, often argue with you and want to change things. Then you say, well, hang on, if I change it for you, I have to go back to the head committee and change it all the way through the chain again. And I could tell you that we probably spent three and a half to four months uh, managing ethics committees. So um, that's one of the issues that many of you in rehabilitation may well need to deal with. Uh, patient selection. This was the first trial in which we didn't... Uh, um, we didn't identify a single disease condition. It wasn't only CHF or COPD. We were saying any patient has been hospitalized twice in the previous year, we can manage them. And that was the criteria. So we looked at chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, coronary artery disease, hypertensive disease, congestive heart failure, diabetes, and asthma. Uh, so we have all of those patients. We case matched them according to age, gender, major diagnosis, the socioeconomic index for areas, and that was the way we selected the, the uh, so this project has got many differences from other trials, and I'm not going to go through all of them in enormous conditions, because I want to go to the tele-rehabilitation part, which I know is what really matters to you. Uh, but we did want to sort of look at what, were, what evidence does the government need in order to be able to deploy telehealth nationally. And what we realised very soon was that the government is particularly nervous about funding anything that does not involve a provider and a patient. That's what Medicare does. He's been doing that for the last many, many uh, decades. And anything that's different than that, it makes them very nervous because Medicare is an uncapped budget item. So they, they're scared that it may be exploited, manipulated, and go out of control. So to, to overcome that, you have to provide really concrete, solid information. So this trial is meant to give them this sort of information. We hope they will achieve that aim. Um, so we're looking at outcomes, and outcomes in our case not only healthcare outcomes, that certainly is one of the most important ones, but we're also looking at the impact on existing clinical models of care. And we found some amazing cultural issues that came up, uh, in which, for example, in one group, which is hospital-based, uh, we couldn't understand why they weren't recruiting patients. And at the end of it, what happened was there were all these eligible patients were coming in, and most of them were being rejected. And it came out that three nurses and two registrars felt genuinely that they could really only manage between five and ten chronically ill patients. And we said, well, that's completely economically impossible. Uh, but they said, oh, but we care about our patients. And we said, well, we care about our patients as well. And we showed them this lovely video about how our patients were excited about what we were doing. So it took months to change the model of care because the workplace culture there was this incredibly intensive hands-on loving of individuals which meant that I could really only look after five to ten people with three nurses and two registrars. This is just one small example of how important workplace cultures are when you try to introduce a new way of working. So we're also looking at utilisation of clinical staff and services, acceptability and usability, analysis of health economic variables, impact on patients and carers, impact on workplace culture, and all the other issues I spoke about. So quite comprehensive outcomes. Um, we also did something quite unique, and I think our data here will be unique as well, because we've now linked up 
vital signs from the home, from the telemedcare device, with PBS data and MBS data from the DHS, from Health Roundtable hospital data, uh, recorded events in the trial portal, which is our, our own internal system, and some uh, interviews, soft data from interviews. So this is the most comprehensive data set on home telecare ever collected. And it was a huge effort because, let me tell you, extracting data from the DHS to link up to hospital roundtable data is a huge effort. Nonetheless, we have the data now. We're rushing to analyse it. So there's the model. We have to develop an integration engine, which was... Uh, th oh, never mind. Uh, an integration engine which involves this part that links up those eight different data sources and then to make it secure and available to the researchers. And that's an interesting contribution, we hope, to the national discussion on how to manage this data. Uh, I'll go through this fairly quickly. So the evaluation framework is uh, very comprehensive. As you see here, we've got self-reported outcomes. We've got service use, hospital util utilisation, uh, primary care utilisation, clinical effectiveness, um, uh, cost, data quality, uh, and user experience, which is very important, both in terms of participant experience and in terms of carer's experience. So that's the evaluation framework that we are following for this project. Um, one of the major contributions we are making is to also add value by risk stratifying automatically patients. Because when we go to the 100,000 patients, we'd like to be able to know almost automatically that out of those, say, 90% are sick but stable, 10% are showing early adverse signs, 10% are showing acute exacerbations, and then to focus their attention on those that need care. This orchestration of care is where we'll get enormous efficiencies in terms of uh, case loads, etc., for community workers. Uh, anyway, we're doing all sorts of statistical stuff to summarise data. I'm going to go through because I want to go to the tele-rehabilitation. But this is, for the first time, trying to show what is statistically significant change and what is clinically significant change. What we're beginning to find out, for example, is that a subclinical change in temperature, a subclinical increase in heart rate, a subclinical change in uh, vital capacity often will precipitate, will indicate very early that a person is getting a lung infection. So this very early data analytics may give you some very interesting data. Anyway, mobile cardiac rehabilitation. I didn't want to get to the rehabilitation, so I'm rushing like mad. I apologise. Uh, this is the project that was done at the eHealth Research Centre, and it's uh, really the first RCT of a mobile cardiac re rehabilitation involving phone, a phone that supports you in doing exercises. It gives you information about your health. It allows you to... Uh, um, Sorry, uh, anyway, there's the summary of it. There's a web application. You collect data, you collect weights, you collect blood pressures via a phone. It, uh, it helps you uh, run an exercise program, and then you have a care team that supports you in that process. What's interesting is this is the result of a significant... Um, in each case, in terms of uptake, adherence, and completion, the phone-based rehabilitation program was more effective than the usual centre-based rehabilitation program. And this has now been published in Heart and was identified in Nature as one of the first randomised controlled trial of cardiac rehabilitation using a phone. A project that we now have started, which may be of interest to you as well, is that I personally believe that exercise is miraculous. I have very bad knees, and if I don't do my 20 minutes of 28 strokes, which is 560 flexions of my knee, they tend to seize up and become very bad. If I do that, my knees are fantastic. Exercise is miraculous. I've had a, a publication of that piece since the 1980s. Nothing new, you all know that. But how to do exercise at home safely after a person's had a heart attack is really quite a challenge. So this project looks at that, and hopefully in a couple of years' time we'll come through there. The importance of exercise, we all know. Great, five more minutes, that's wonderful. I've got five more minutes. So the importance of exercise in terms of cardiac rehabilitation, in terms of diabetes and overweight is obviously critical. And our role was to, how do we do this at home able to be supervised and safely. So uh, we know that for pulmonary rehabilitation as well as cardiac, uh, cardiac rehab, uh, exercise improves exercise capacity, reduces breathlessness, improves quality of life, reduces test infections, reduces time spent in hospital. But we deliver pulmonary rehabilitation. Now, that 1% is a bit out of date. It may be 2% now, maybe 3%. I don't know the exact figure. That was 2010 data. But we don't have enough programs, especially in rural and regional Australia, not enough health professionals and poor patient access to existing programs. I suspect that hasn't changed a great deal, but maybe you can fix me on that. Uh, so our model of rehabilitation is working at home 
by being able to be automatically connected to a rehabilitation specialist in the distance at any site through advanced ICT. Very specifically, what we have is patients wearing very simple pulse oximeters, uh, a specialised bike that we've modified somewhat, very comfortable bike, it's an air vein bike, so workload increases with pedalling grade. Uh, we have a simple tablet that's used for uh, video conferencing on demand and in response to increasing risk factors. Um, the risk factors that we're looking at is arrhythmia, low SpO2, breathing and fatigue scores, facial recognition of stress and fatigue. That's quite new. This is a CSRO development. So we're able to track features on the face and we should be able to identify when the person is struggling. And maybe that's an additional flag that we raise. So when sufficient flags are raised, this will automatically connect the patient to the rehabilitation specialist. The rehabilitation specialist will know this person's exercising uh, and it will create a video connection at the right time. So this is our current project. It's part of, part of an ARC grant that we've submitted. Hopefully it will be funded. Uh, we also do tracking of the actual workload to achieve a desired heart rate profile. And that's been very sophisticated and involves a lot of mathematics. It's control theory applied to that. So we can actually give the person an acoustic signal to tell them what rate to exercise to achieve a certain given heart rate. And you can program that heart rate. So when they first start, you start with a very low heart rate, steady state, and then you increase it And when you see there's no particular negative risk factors developing as you exercise. Um, so ultimately, we want to scale this up to many people. Uh, being able to exercise safety at home at a relatively low cost. Um, and over the next two years, we have a very distinctive research program that looks at control strategy because, you know, the human operator is in this loop. And what we found, of course, is that when the human operator starts to become cognitively impaired, the stress, they can no longer track properly. So we have lots of signs that says the patient is not doing well. The, the signs will be physiological through vital signs. They can be cognitive. They can be also from facial recognition. And we think this will allow you to carry out exercise, rehabilitation remotely very safely. So the risk matrix that we identify and we apply weights to uh, to minimise the risk of doing exercise at home includes the drop in arterial oxygen, the development of cardiac arrhythmias, evidence of cognitive defects and evidence of fatigue or respiratory distress from breathing and fatigue scores and change in facial features. So... There is, I think that telerehabilitation at home is the new frontier of telehealth. We're using quite a bit of the technology that's been developed for telehealth, and I think there's lots of opportunities here to engage with all of you in doing the necessary research that will ultimately lead... Oh, OK, this is... No, no, we don't want to do that. That's a two-and-a-half-minute video. We don't have time for it. Thank you very much for your attention.